for this ple pleasure and uh, the invitation, which I feel much honored by. And it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to, to introduce you to the subject of much of my, my research in the past years, also funded by some uh, European grant. Uh, and we will uh, today learn about the progress in supernova theory in particular uh, uh, of the aspect that we now are at the stage of being able to connect uh, self-consistent uh, simulations, numerical models, which show us how supernovae explode by the neutrino-driven mechanism to connect those models to observations. So I already uh, learned from uh, participating in, uh, in uh, uh, Norm's uh, group meeting that there's a lot of grad students around. So I will give an introduction and a little bit of background of this uh, whole field, which is uh, also with respect to theory, pretty old. Supernova modeling, uh, also by numerical uh, methods, is already done for more than 50 years. And uh, we have achieved a pretty uh, dramatic, I would say, uh, status uh, uh, progress in the past couple of years because of the possibility of doing 3D simulations now. And there's a, a larger number of groups uh, around the globe uh, who have, uh, which have now contributed to this uh, progress. Uh, there is a, a next uh, topic which I uh, need to introduce you to because it's really relevant because um, we have learned uh, in this uh, um, exercise and in this uh, um, big enterprise that uh, our initial conditions, the initial conditions from the progenitor site matter a lot in particular. It's not just the density structure and the shell structure of the progenitors. It's also some 3D initial conditions which we need in order to get uh, viable conditions for uh, supernova explosions in uh, three dimensions. And then uh, I will introduce you to some observational implications as much as my time permits. I prepared a lot and I might be fast in some parts. So I want to really give you an overview of the results and of the status uh, instead of digging into the fine details in various aspects. We can do that in the after seminar discussion. There's a, another session going on later and you can ask me questions about details if you're interested in. So I will introduce you to a number of aspects which are listed here, but I will repeat those later. And finally, at the end, I will mention a couple of open issues and perspectives. Let's first begin with an overview of supernova types, the supernova taxonomy. And there is a large variety of kinds of types of supernovae which are mostly uh, classified observationally. From the theory side, we just distinguish mainly between thermonuclear and core collapse events. There's also a mixed event, I will come to those later. And uh, the observ observers uh, actually uh, stick their classification uh, to the properties of light curves and spectra, which are mostly defined by the outer properties, the, the surface properties, the envelope properties of the exploding stars. Uh, I will not so much go into those aspects in detail because also this um, classification pattern is changing over years. So three years later, four years later than the previous slide, uh, there is already a new introduction of a supernova uh, class type 1bn. And here's a, a group of uh, interacting, what they call interacting supernovae. So supernovae uh, whose uh, explosions interact with uh, circumstellar material. And there's also another kind of supernova, which is very hard to observe because it's faint, the ultra faint uh, type 2Ps. And there is, as you see here on top, even the speculation whether this mix of core collapse and thermonuclear explosion, the pair instability supernovae might uh, take place. And now uh, some 10 years later, uh, there is even a new class introduced, which is called superluminous supernovae. So very bright event, 10, 20, 30 times brighter than the brightest other uh, known supernovae. And we are still not sure whether uh, this kind of electron capture supernova occurs, which comes from the pro pro possibly lowest mass uh, masses of progenitor stars collapsing, forming neutron stars and exploding as supernovae. So in my talk, I will mostly focus on these events here, exclude the extreme ones, not talk about thermonuclear at all. And uh, the ones which I talk about uh, include more than 99% of all stellar core collapse events. So uh, I, I apologize, by the way, for my rough and uh, somewhat uh, low, no, low voice. I think I have uh, some consequences of my 
BioNTech uh, Pfizer vaccination, which I received a week ago. I think I feel uh, light symptoms of, uh, of COVID, but uh, it's not bad. So the problems are listed here, some of them. Uh, most uh, interesting, of course, for the theorist uh, over decades was how the supernova mechanism works. And uh, as I mentioned, we have achieved a lot of progress in this respect. Uh, we want to predict from self-consistent models uh, the explosion properties of supernovae, uh, explosion asymmetries, the mixing which is going on during the uh, stellar explosions, uh, and therefore the structure, morphology, uh, composition, asymmetries of uh, the gas remnants left behind by the explosions. Of course, also the compact uh, remnants, neutron stars and black holes and their formation probabilities are interesting to us. We want to predict uh, also the properties of these objects, birth masses, kicks and spins, magnetic fields if possible, which is very difficult actually. Magnetic field amplification in supernovae may play a role, but it's not finally understood. And uh, we also want to predict neutrino and gravitational wave signals, which however, unfortunately can only be measured for galactic events. Uh, neutrino flavor oscillations in supernovae are a big topic currently for the neutrino particle physicists heavy element formation, possible production of elements beyond the iron peak elements, the so-called R process elements is interesting. And finally, of course, connected to the Newton star properties, we also um, might use supernovae as a laboratory for exploring the conditions in hot, uh, dense nuclear matter in matter of uh, newborn neutron stars. This is a slide which shows you the general, I, I like to use this slide, it's adapted from, adapted from, from Adam Burroughs, uh, one of his reviews in 1990. Uh, it shows the scenario which you should have in your mind when we talk about stellar core collapse. So we have these evolved massive stars, stars may be more massive than something nine, nine to 10 solar masses. And these stars possess uh, this well-known onion shell structure at the end of their lives when they have uh, gone through a, a succession of uh, nuclear burning stages. And at the core of these stars, we have a degenerate uh, object, uh, either an iron core or an oxygen near magnesium core, which is stabilized by the degeneracy pressure of electrons, Fermi pressure of electrons. Fermions uh, exert pressure when they are highly condensed and highly compressed. And so this object has roughly the size of our moon, but it's, it's cold and it's stabilized by degeneracy pressure. And due to some nuclear physics, um, uh, nuclear statistically equilibrium changes, nuclear photo disintegrations, and weak interaction processes, uh, mostly the production of electron neutrinos in electron captures, this iron core becomes unstable, collapses within fractions of a second to a neutron star, a shock wave is launched somehow, and this will uh, lead us to the next uh, a couple of slides, uh, explodes, uh, uh, this shock, shock wave explodes the star, and what is left behind is a hot neutron star, which radiates uh, neutrinos uh, in huge numbers. Uh, most of the gravitational binding energy of the neutron star is, is, uh, is uh, radiated away uh, by these neutrinos. And within seconds, the neutron becomes then compact, more compact, neutrino transparent, and uh, cools down over the next couple of thousands of years by more neutrino radiation, and in the end, by photon emission. What I mentioned already are neutrinos, and they really play a crucial role in this whole scenario. They don't not, uh, do not only carry away this uh, huge amount of gravitational binding energy released in the formation event of a neutron star, but in the neutron, st in the neutron star, in the supernova core, neutrinos also transport energy, lepton number, momentum, and angular momentum. And uh, for these reasons, uh, it, neutrinos have to be included uh, if we talk about uh, some kind of realistic I don't like this word in connection uh, to models, but uh, some people want to use it. Let's say self-consistent models of supernova explosions uh, require the inclusion of neutrino elements. We know that uh, the fact that neutrinos are included, have to be included in, in our models. Uh, this is not only a speculation, but we have observational confirmation from the supernova here, the famous supernova 1987A and uh, several detectors, underground detectors uh, around the globe, Japan, in the US, and in a Russian experiment in the Baksan laboratory have measured uh, in total about two dozens of neutrinos and the energies of neut these neutrinos, but also the total energy connected to these neutrinos and the duration of the measured neutrino signals 
that was predicted uh, just a year before uh, Supernova 1987A in a seminal paper by uh, Boros and Latimer, where they, for the first time, uh, constructed numerical models of neutron star cooling, uh, proton neutron star cooling, uh, starting with hot neutron star matter in a somewhat realistic manner, and they exactly predicted uh, these properties of the neutrino emission. So we know that neutrinos play this role, as I mentioned, and we have to include them. Let me go through a couple of slides, uh, cartoonish slides, in order to show you what goes on in detail. I don't dig into the detailed microphysics too much because that's very complicated and I would need a lecture course to do that and uh, typically teach that, teach that over several uh, subsequent lectures. But let's us at least uh, get an impression of uh, the overall dynamics of this event. So we have again this onion shell structure of the progenitor. At the center, this degenerate core here. In this case, I, I, I sketched an iron core. And what we will consider on the next slides is just this interior part where the explosion starts and where the physics is going on, which launches the explosion. This is a zoom in. And what I also added already on this cartoonish slide is a perturbation in the oxygen shell. And this later on during my talk will turn out to be extremely relevant when we talk about the success of supernova explosions. And uh, you should not think of these stars as idealistic, uh, ideal spheres, as uh, idealized spherical uh, structures as given to us by stellar evolution modelers, but these stars are highly perturbed already at the onset of collapse. So this iron core begins to collapse and within less than a second, a proto-neutron star forms at the center, nuclear matter densities are reached, this whole uh, interior stiffens, the equation of state stiffens, a bounce shock is created, and this shock front uh, with high energy initially begins to run outwards through the still infalling iron core material. What happens then is actually bothered uh, theorists for more than 20 years, maybe even 30 years. Uh, more and more detailed simulations were used to study that. This is what uh, uh, happens when this shock tra uh, 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 transitions or when this shock propagates through this iron material. Namely, these iron group nuclei uh, initially existing in this stellar core are uh, dissociated into neutrons and protons, and this consumes huge amounts of energy, which, that, uh, which then um, uh, is tapped from the shock energy and which leads to a stagnation of this uh, initial bounce shock still well inside of this iron core. So this initial bounce shock mechanism, which was still hoped to be successful in the late 1960s, 1970s, this turned out uh, not to work. More and more detailed models, better and better microphysics, uh, better and better treatment of neutrino transport showed that this bounce shock is initially not successful, but it stagnates. And it has to be revived by some physical mechanism. And this mechanism already was suggested in the 1960s, Sterling Colgate and Richard White in their first seminal paper speculated, they didn't really simulate that in detail, but assumed neutrinos deposit to deposit energy in the supernova core. And uh, now with our more realistic and detailed neutrino transport uh, treatment, we indeed see that neutrino energy deposition happens with a high rate around the neutron star. So about five to 10% of the radiated electron neutrinos and antineutrinos are absorbed in this material behind the shock wave. And if this mechanism is sufficiently efficient, the shock wave can be relaunched, can be reaccelerated, can be revived, as we say, and can be pushed outward. And being pushed outward, the shock wave is accelerated and uh, runs down a density gradient. And by the heating of this material in this uh, shock uh, heated layers, uh, the um, uh, freshly uh, nuclear synthesized uh, nickel is formed, which makes the supernova bright over months and years. And also in this neutrino heated material, which is rising in bubbles and plumes behind the outward going shock wave, uh, nickel and iron group material can be assembled. And when this shock travels outwards, uh, it leaves behind, as I mentioned before, the neutrons are radiating still uh, for another 10 seconds or so, radiating neutrinos and cooling off uh, by this intense uh, neutrino radiation and converting actually initially proton rich matter into the final neutron rich material. This can be also quantified. Uh, don't want to go into too many details here. It's just maybe for the grad students, a kind of impression that you can do uh, zero of order estimates also on a sheet of paper. Uh, so this has already been done by Beta and Wilson in the seminal paper in 1985. Uh, but uh, we do that also now when we look at more detailed conditions from simulations. 
The main processes of neutrino heating, which deposit the energy for the explosion, is electron neutrino absorption of neutrons and anti neutrino absorption of protons. The inverse processes of the neutrino production in the neutron star. And you can estimate this and you find positive energy input depending on the neutrino luminosity, the neutrino spectral temperature or mean neutrino energy, which is uh, linked to the spectral temperature, to the square, and then this inverse of the radius, uh, the distance to the neutrino radiating surface of the neutron star uh, to the square because of this dilution factor, uh, uh, which you know from any, any uh, stellar source. Uh, there is also neutrino cooling. The point is only that the temperature, which scales uh, into the cooling term to the sixth power, that the temperature drops like one over radius outside of the neutron star. And therefore, this term here uh, decreases like uh, the radius, um, one over the radius to the sixth power, and much, much steeper than the heating term. And therefore, there's a radius, which we call gain radius. And uh, where when this uh, radius, um, uh, outside of this radius, the neutrino heating dominates the cooling by far. And you can then estimate the neutrino energy de deposition rate uh, when you put in reasonable numbers for the mass in the gain layer, what we call gain layer when neutrinos deposit energy, a typical radius for the gain radius. You find that the energy deposition rate is huge, is of the order of about 10 to the 52 ergs per second. So neutrinos depositing energy in that layer would lead to a 10 to the 51 erg explosion within a tenth of a second. What matters here is, of course, the time over which neutrinos are able to deposit this energy. We call this dwell time. This is the time material stays in the gain layer. You can connect this uh, to the mass flow rate through the gain layer. And then with typical numbers for the mass in the gain layer and the mass flow rate through the gain layer, you end up with an energy of the order of a typical type two supernova explosion energy. There's, of course, still the binding energy of the stellar material ahead of the shock. So you have to subtract that. And if you do that, you end up with maybe an energy between some 10 to the 50 ergs and 10 to the 51 ergs. This is just from a simple calculation. It's a threshold phenomenon which we are considering here. So it depends on a competition between mass accretion rate and neutrino luminosity in the simplest notion. And this was actually already um, understood by Adam Boros and, uh, and Goshi in the 19, early 1990s. And uh, time evolution, uh, the time evolution goes down here in this plot with mass accretion. And if these uh, yeah, trajectories of the stellar core evolution of the neutrino emission evolution, if these trajectories transition the critical line, an explosion is possible. If these trajectories stay, the evolution trajectories of the collapsing stellar core stay below, or here in this case, above this critical line, uh, below the lum luminosity, the critical luminosity, then uh, the explosion is not possible. We now can actually compare this theoretical concept uh, to real simulations in 2D and 3D. Again, I don't go into the details. Uh, this has been done in a recent paper of Alexander Zuma, a postdoc in my group, uh, published in APJ some three years ago. And you find that there's actually more parameters entering this game. There's also this functional here, depending on the square of the neutrino energy, because the heating rate, the energy deposition rate of neutrinos depends on the squared neutrino energy. And there is also a term which depends on the neutron star mass and the correction term, which takes into account turbulence, rotation, and uh, maybe some effects which are linked to the progenitor details around the gain radius. And so uh, coining uh, the relation in a more complex, a complex form leads uh, to this critical line being a straight uh, line here in this plot uh, with these quantities on the axis. And you see that the successful models uh, here, the ones in 3D are colored, in, in 2D are in gray, the successful models all transition this line and the line, the critical line is very similar in 2D and 3D. So this is the theory which we have understood pretty well. Uh, but the uh, if I move on, I have a question. Sure. So you say, so you show that there's a critical line between the connect that depends on the mass accretion rate and the luminosity. And the mass accretion rate, I can understand, depends on the progenitor. But how does the luminosity depend on the property of the progenitor? Uh, now, yeah, uh, that's a good question. Actually, there's a paper by Thomas Ertl and myself published in APJ in 2016 where you see how this, um, how uh, this, these parameters are, can be converted into the neutrino parameters. But the, 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 simple, the simple answer is the luminosity depends to a high degree 
also on the neutron star mass and the mass accretion rate. For that reason, this, um, this uh, term here uh, indirectly also contains dependencies on these parameters. And the line is no horizontal line, it's actually a, 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 a tilted line also in, 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 the, in, the, in the phase space or the parameter space of progenitor properties for exactly that reason. Does that answer your question? Um, well, I'm still confused because my, maybe I have the wrong picture in mind, but what I have in mind is that the core collapses when it reaches basically the Chandrasekhar limit. So uh, I would, I would naively guess that all of the cores would have similar properties and the luminosity would be the same, but you're saying that they could, they could change. I don't know now which luminosities you mean. At the core collapse, at the onset of core collapse, the neutrino luminosities are not, not, not high. Uh, we have core envelope decoupling in that case, uh, which means that the core luminosity, the luminosity of photons or whatever uh, convection uh, luminosity produced in the core is not actually transferred to the envelope surface right away. When we talk about the core collapse properties, the onset of collapse, there is a variety, a, a large variety of masses of these cores at the onset of, co uh, of collapse. It's not triggered by the Chandrasekhar mass of a cold white dwarf uh, mass um, uh, limit uh, determined by Chandrasekhar. It's a hot uh, degenerate condition there where thermal pressure, where also the, uh, the, the details of the microphysical processes like electron capture and photo disintegration can play a role where rotation can make modifications. So there is a, a variety no of, of corrections to the I'm not sure it's gonna fall in I heard somebody talking, but I didn't hear what this person said. I, I, it sounds like they weren't talking to us. Ah, okay. So um, uh, the onset of collapse is not happening at a fixed mass. Stellar core masses at the onset of collapse uh, range between 1.3 solar masses and 2.4 solar masses, or even 2.5 solar masses of the heaviest uh, um, uh, iron cores which, which undergo stellar core collapse. If that was the question, I really don't know exactly what is the question you are really interested in. Oh, no, that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I was asking. Because, so, okay, so I, my, in my mind, I, I thought that the, um, the core would have, we always have the same property. I'm saying no. that more no. complicated than that. That's, that's exactly no. what I was asking. I will show you a plot in a few minutes where you will see that there is also a large difference of the density pros, a profile around the degenerate core. It's not just differences in the degenerate core and mass differences of the degenerate core. It's also differences in the environmental material of or in the mantle material around the stellar core. But I will show this in a couple of minutes. OK, thank you. So the necessary effort we have to do is actually, we have to consider self-consistent up initial three-dimensional, best three-dimensional simulations with neutrino transport in order to answer the question of stellar explosions. And these models, which I don't go into the details of what we do on the numerical side, uh, that's a big effort uh, in my group, uh, development over decades actually, uh, of many PhD students who have uh, joined this en enter enterprise in my group. But it's a very complicated problem uh, where we have to solve uh, the hydrodynamics equations or even magnetohydrodynamics equations with some consideration of relativistic effects, at least uh, in a kind of a, an, a correction way or, or in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a, 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 an effective way. We have to uh, consider general relativity. We have a nuclear equation of state. We have neutrino transport and neutrino reactions. And we have the, uh, the crucial progenitor conditions which we have to use. And feeding all this into a dynamical model then allows us with long and, and, and tedious simulations uh, to predict neutrino and gravitational wave properties to in the end predict explosion energies and remnant masses, light curves, nuclear synthesis in supernovae and explosion asymmetries as well as the uh, asymmetries which lead to pulsar kicks and the neutron star formation properties. Uh, here's one of the reasons why we need to do that best in 3D. There is a significant difference in the geometry of two-dimensional simulations, which assume a symmetry axis here in the vertical direction compared to the three-dimensional uh, case. You see not only that two-dimensional simulations have this artificial toroidal geometry of uh, all asymmetries, um, while in 3D there are plumes. In 2D, there is also an inverse uh, cascading of turbulent energy from small to large scales, 
And what we have learned in this enterprise is that large scales plumes, which are able to push the shock outwards are helpful for the explosion. In three dimensions, we have the opposite trend. We have actually energy cascading from the largest scales, the volume filling scales to smaller turbulent scales, fragmentation of uh, vortex structures happens and this transports energy out of the most helpful three dimension uh, largest scales. And this means that we expect in 3D uh, explosions to be harder and to be more difficult than in 2D. And this is actually what we have seen in our simulations. Now for this diversity of progenitor structures. And here I show you uh, the way how we look at these kinds of conditions in the collapsing stars. So first of all, here in the upper right part of this, um, of this slide, I have a density profile plotted for different progenitors as a function of the logarithm of radius. Also the density years in logarithmic units. And you see that the densities are very different at the onset of stellar core collapse in these different progenitors, but also the core masses differ quite a lot. That's not so easily visible here. One would have to show uh, a mass scale here instead of the radius scale. But believe me, the core masses here range between about 1.3 solar masses for the highest, uh, the cores with the highest densities to up to about two solar masses for the cores with the lowest densities. And if we go down, uh, if we go up in mass even further in progenitor mass in zero H min sequence mass to the pulsational pair instability supernova regime, the iron cores at the onset of collapse have even 2.5 to 2.6 solar masses uh, at maximum. So the iron core masses differ, but also the density profiles around the iron cores differ a lot. And this leads to different mass accretion rates, low mass accretion rates on the newly formed neutron star, high mass accretion rates on the newly formed neutron star, making explosions usually much harder. And this kind of dependence on the mass accretion rate is also reflected here by what is called the compactness parameter, which was introduced by O'Connor and Ott in a paper. It measures the mass um, here, certain mass is chosen usually 2.5 solar masses, for example, uh, enclosed by, um, uh, by the corresponding radius, divided by the radius which encloses this mass. And you see that this compactness parameter varies a lot. High compactness means that a small radius is associated to this 2.5 solar masses here, chosen as this psi uh, with uh, 2.5. Uh, so that means a small radius, and that means, of course, that there's a very high density around the iron core making the radius which encloses 2.5 solar masses very small. And these stars are harder to explode than the stars with low compactness. There is, however, a, a, a subtle dependence on the neutron star mass and the mass accretion rate, which can also boost the neutrino luminosity. So the real situation is not as simple as being coined by a simple one parameter function. We have introduced actually Thomas Ertler and myself in 2016 in a theoretical paper. We have introduced a two parameter criterion which captures the physics uh, better based on the uh, underlying neutrino and core structure uh, in, and not just a, a one parameter uh, description of the, of the complex physics. Now, three dimensional simulations, and I show you now a number of slides where we uh, see the progress of our work over maybe nearly a decade. So this is the simplest case where we received explosions already in a paper in 2006. I would call this as a first modern successful supernova explosion. And this was even possible in spherical symmetry at that time because we considered the lowest uh, kind of progenitors uh, core, uh, do undergoing core collapse, the so-called electron capture supernova case. And here you see the result of a spherical symmetric simulation uh, in a kind of a mass shell plot. It's a movie-like uh, um, visualization where you see the mass shells collapsing, forming the neutron star here at the center. This is logarithm of the radius. A shock wave is formed, at core bounds, the shock wave propagates out. You see that it's expanding all the time here in these kinds of progenitors. And then it's accelerating when it hits the edge of this degenerate oxygen near magnesium core, runs down a density gradient and is accelerating outwards. And finally, neutrino heating sets in and neutrinos deposit the energy for the explosion. This can be achieved as it is here done in spherical symmetry already. We can also do the sim simulations in two dimensions or in three dimensions. We find some instabilities which, call the, uh, which, which create these mushroom types of uh, structures, which is uh, nothing else than 
Rayleigh-Taylor instability, which you know also from bomb explosions in the Earth atmospheres, uh, Earth atmosphere that mushrooms rise, high entropy material uh, rises when energy release, um, uh, strong energy release happens, uh, well localized uh, in, in a stratified atmosphere. And this happens also with the neutrino heating around the neutron star. And we see these atmosphere structures created by neutrino heating. These, however, are not crucial for these uh, electron capture supernova uh, explosions. A similar kind of explosion condition is met in the lowest iron core supernova progenitors. Here a 9.6 solar mass star, a zero metallicity star, but we have also recently, more recently, investigated a nine solar mass solar metallicity progenitor. We also find very rapid explosion in such a case, marginally in spherical symmetry. This is from a three-dimensional simulation. I can show you a movie of that simulation. Sorry for that. Uh, start the movie right away. Uh, here's the movie. And you see uh, here an isoentropy surface around the neutron star, which is sitting at the center, not seen here. Maybe you can see it uh, in a bluish uh, color later. Uh, if the blooms become transparent, maybe you see it later. And here, this enveloping surface is the shock wave, which is um, marked by a certain entropy. Here is the entropy of the shock wave. And this is the entropy uh, you see here as, an, as, a, as a surface. Uh, and uh, sorry, I will continue the movie. Let's go back to the beginning. And you will see these plumes, uh, which I mentioned before, rising and pushing the shock further out. The shock wave, however, is rapidly accelerating in this low mass progenitor, 9.6 solar mass star, as I said. And it's detached them after a while from the plumes, which rise behind the shock wave. And the shock wave is already uh, propagating at about 20 to 30,000 kilometers um, into the overlying stellar material, uh, the uh, supernova, uh, the neutrino heated material is expanding behind this, uh, this shock wave. There's some asymmetries created uh, in this early explosion phase by these mushrooms, but these asymmetries are relatively modest. We think that these low mass explosions may explain an explosion like the crab supernova. Maybe if I have time at the end of my talk and maybe in the discussion afterwards, we can come back to that. These explosions, sorry, I want to mention that these explosions are pretty low with respect to their energy. The previous one, the oxygen and magnesium core explosion created about uh, 10 to the 50 ergs instead of the canonical 10 to the 51 ergs of explosion energy. And this low mass iron core explosion is similarly uh, low energetic, uh, about 10 to the 50 ergs uh, only. In the high mass progenitors, higher mass progenitors, we don't only have convective asymmetries, uh, the ones I, uh, you saw before, but we also have uh, what is called the SASI instability, the standing accretion shock instability. And instead of explaining this here with a slide that it's a kind of a sloshing mode of the shock, let me better show you a movie where you see this SASI instability developing in a rotating a uh, progenitor model, a 15 solar mass star, which also explodes in a three-dimensional simulation. You see the same kind of um, visualization as I showed you before, a kind of isoentropy surface, the shock wave around. You see here the rotation, and you will see a kind of sloshing mode and spiral mode instability here of the shock wave, a large scale asymmetry developing behind the shock wave. And this is a SASI instability, a standing accretion shock instability, which pushes the shock also further out and also supports the explosion in this three-dimensional simulation of a rapidly rotating progenitor. This progenitor would give birth to a neutron star rotating with a period of about two milliseconds. So rotation was pretty important. And I can tell you here, it was even crucial for the explosion. We did not obtain an explosion in this 15 solar mass progenitor if uh, we consider slowly rotating or non-rotating models. We have another case which we published in 2015 already of 20 solar mass model where we achieved an explosion. But this explosion at that time had to be tuned still by slightly modifying the neutrino physics. Since I don't think there's any neutrino experts uh, in the audience, I, I met uh, Norm's group before. I did not hear anybody talking about neutrinos. Uh, in this, in this um, simulation, we actually modified some correction terms, which um, add strangeness uh, corrections to the neutral current neutrino nucleon scattering, 
that's as much as I want to say, the overall changes in the neutrino nucleon scattering opacities, only one kind of neutrino interaction was of the order of 10 to 15%. And this was sufficient to make an unsuccessful initial run with this 20 solar mass model, finally exploding by neutrino heating. And I want to show you also the movie here, now starting the movie. Again, the same way to visualize this. And now you will see the SASI instability developing even without rotation. So this progenitor was non-rotating and you see a SASI sloshing mode. And now you see convective uh, instabilities, but you see also a SASI a rotational SASI mode. This is not uh, now, now rotating. Uh, the rotating SASI mode is just an artificial rotation of the simulation. Here you see that it's convection uh, going on. And there was just before we, we had this artificial rotation to show you the three-dimensional structure, we had SASI a spiral mode for a short while. In progenitors which collapse to black holes, these instabilities, the SASI instability, the spiral and the soft sloshing instability can become extremely strong. I don't show a movie now of a black hole form formation case, but we have simulated black hole formation models as well for 40 and 75 solar mass progenitors. And we see a lot of SASI activity in those progenitors when they collapse to black holes. So uh, now what's the current uh, situation? The current situation is that actually we have recognized that it's extremely difficult to make these stars, the 20 solar mass or the 15 solar mass models exploding. And the reason is because we had very low amplitude perturbations in the progenitor only artificial seed perturbations of these asymmetries, which you saw developing during the explosion. In reality, however, we think that the progenitor is already a three-dimensional uh, structure, has a geometry in the silicon and oxygen layers, which is massively perturbed. And you see this here from a simulation which Bernhard Müller did for an 18 solar mass progenitor a couple of years ago. And um, he, he uh, actually simulated the convection in the oxygen shell for about five minutes in this progenitor. And you see that over this long evolution period, this oxygen shell prior to stellar core collapse develops already large asymmetries in composition, but also in the velocity field. Infall and outfall uh, velocities can be seen here in different colors. And these velocities actually reach here about 20% of the local sound speed. And you see a kind of an L equal to a quadrupolar pattern having developed in this oxygen shell. And this turned out for the 18 solar mass progenitor to be crucial to obtain an explosion. Bernhard simulated actually um, simulated from a spherically symmetric progenitor model with low amplitude perturbations and did not find any explosion in that model. The shock is contracting while when he started his simulation with the three-dimensional initial conditions of the onset of core collapse, the, the shock is running out and is producing a successful and highly asymmetric supernova explosion. We see this also in a 19 solar mass progenitor where Naveen Yadav, postdoc in my group, was crucially involved. So this simulation was carried out over seven minutes. And I show you a movie of the progenitor simulation which was going back minus seven minutes before the onset of stellar core collapse. Here you see a movie which shows, let me explain the details here. It shows an isosurface of the silicon mass fraction inside of the oxygen shell. So oxygen burning creates silicon. And this is an isosurface of silicon and color coded on this surface is the radial velocity. Blue means outward going velocities, red means inward going velocities. And initially, this convection starts relatively modest. So you see it's buoyant. It's, it's kind of uh, yeah, a corrugated isosurface. But then after a couple of minutes, there is a huge expansion of this, um, yeah, of this isosurface of silicon. That means that there is a lot of uh, enhanced burning of oxygen. And the reason is that there was an unburned neon layer, which was sitting in the oxygen shell, and it's now encompassed in this three-dimensional oxygen burning, and it leads to an oxygen neon shell merger, which is actually seen in quite a number of progenitors in the mass range between about 18 and 22 solar masses. So it's not a rare case, it's a pretty generic situation, and it creates a highly perturbed asymmetric structure at the onset of stellar core collapse. A question. And, yes, a question. Uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, to what extent is that result perhaps uh, 
uh, influenced by your initial condition because you're not yeah. you're not yeah. simulating the previous stage of yes. shell burning. Yes, that's a very fair question, and it's also a question which bothers me. Uh, it's a good question. It may depend, of course, on uh, some initial situation which is created by a one-dimensional stellar evolution, uh, which has been carried out over millions of years. You will well understand that we will not be able uh, in the foreseeable future to run 15 million years in three dimensions. So we need to actually proceed in steps. At the moment, we are able to simulate um, about uh, maybe up to maybe 10 minutes or so. The record is a uh, record model, I think, was published recently by Bernard Müller uh, with a student of his, Neil uh, McNeil and, and Müller, where they ran a rotating progenitor for about 12 minutes. But we have the goal here in Garching to maybe running these models for a couple of hours, but that's probably the end of the story which we can achieve. So we have to go back maybe by a couple of hours, but we will not be able to go back by days or for days of or even longer periods of time to run these three dimensional models. Yeah, okay. that's an issue, but it's not solvable at the moment, I think. We can only take what we, what we can achieve today. And we use these initial conditions, which I showed on the previous slide. So here on the left slide, this initial model at the onset of collapse. So the, the iron core is sitting deep inside this, uh, this uh, isosilicon surface. And then we run this model. Actually, we ran it self-consistently with three-dimensional transport for, more, for nearly two seconds, and then continued in a, in, a, in a way which is still treating the neutrinos very, very well. We continued for another five seconds. We ran this model for seven seconds in three dimensions. And you can see that we develop a highly asymmetric explosion. It's a record holder uh, for a three-dimensional explosion simulation with self-consistent neutrino treatment. You see the neutrino luminosities over this whole period of time and the mean neutrino energy. So we can follow mostly in three dimensions, most of the neutron star cooling evolution. And we can actually also follow the evolution of the increasing explosion energy for this period of time. And you see that it's not possible as you see in many other papers, to stop the simulation after a second and predict the final explosion energy, the explosion energy is rising for a whole, um, for the whole proto-Newton star uh, evolution, which we simulated here, it's rising for seven seconds and nearly uh, achieves its final value after these seven seconds only. Uh, so this is a, a crucial result because we achieve in this three-dimensional simulation self-consistently an explosion energy of about one beta, 10 to the 51 ergs. It's a viable, uh, fully converged uh, energy of this explosion. And we are in the ballpark of predicting uh, neutrino-driven um, yeah, models uh, or uh, observational cases like supernova uh, uh, 87A on the basis of neutrino-driven three-dimensional explosion simulations. Let me summarize uh, here the achievements which are actually have been uh, made in the community. I, I mentioned a couple of uh, the models in three dimensions, which uh, we published here in Garching um, in the recent years in collaboration still with Bernhard Müller at Monash. Uh, the most recent one is uh, published um, uh, this 19 solar mass model in a recent paper by Bollig et al. Um, uh, Bernhard Müller at Monash uh, continued with his own code uh, to investigate different kinds of progenitors uh, here, uh, non-rotating progenitors uh, of the low mass uh, uh, supernova type he investigated also ultra stripped uh, supernova progenitors in three dimensions, getting explosions uh, in uh, these uh, simulations. There is uh, some achievements at Oak Ridge uh, in this group there. Um, Tony Metzakapa in this group uh, had a successful 15 solar mass explosion at about the same time when we published 20 and, and the 9.6 solar mass cases. There is some progress by Japanese researchers. They had a very early explosion of an 11 solar mass star um, in, uh, in 2014, but they now consider more black hole formation and rapidly rotational cases. There is some uh, uh, results by the Caltech and uh, NCSU group, um, some uh, mass uh, range between 15 and 40 solar masses. And more recently, uh, the Princeton group around Adam Boros has become very active and has produced a suit of three-dimensional explosion models between nine and 40 solar masses but none of those models going beyond one second. So uh, our 19 solar mass model has really been pushed forward into this energy saturation regime where we now see what uh, the explosions can achieve with respect to uh, explosion energies by neutrino heat. 
these models differ quite significantly with respect uh, to the treatments of the details, in particular on the neutrino side, but also on the progenitor conditions uh, side. Um, this, uh, this group, uh, for example, used artificial perturbations, and we don't know exactly what they use. They, they claim they follow some paper by Bernhard Müller and myself in 2015, but what is described in that paper doesn't sound uh, very similar to what we had analyzed uh, at that time in 2015 for our two-dimensional simulations. So I really don't know how they trigger their explosions, but it seems to be pretty uh, agreeable between the groups now that we need three-dimensional conditions in the progenitor in order to obtain successful uh, neutrino-driven explosions in three dimensions. The status is therefore that uh, three-dimensional modeling has re uh, reached the mature stage. Uh, two dimensions and three dimensions differ in many aspects, so uh, we have to actually do these simulations best in 3D in order to be on a predictive level uh, for observ observable properties of supernovae. Uh, however, explosions in 3D are more difficult to obtain than in 2D, and we have now a growing number of successful three dimensional models, uh, which, were, which were published over the past five years or so by different groups around the globe. And we have the very recent simulations which see saturation of the explosion energy for a couple of cases, low mass cases, but now also this massive 19 solar mass progenitor. As I said, one of the worrisome issues is that progenitors produced by MESA calculations or by other groups, Kepler simulations by Stan Woosley and collaborators, Alex Heger, these models are in spherical uh, symmetry. They have been evolved over millions of years in spherical symmetry. Uh, and we create need to create the three-dimensional initial conditions by these uh, simulations, which I have introduced to you. We have to go back a couple of minutes, best hours if possible, and have to simulate the ongoing convection in the uh, uh, pre-collapse oxygen and silicon shells. We may also be resolution limited still here. There is an investigation of uh, resolution dependencies going on uh, now at Monash. Bernard Müller has a computer time grant for that. I did that a couple of years ago with uh, Tobias Melson, a PhD student in my group. We think uh, with two, deg two degree simulations, we are at the, we are at the threshold uh, to convergence in particular when we start already with high amplitude perturbations in the progenitor, which stir the post-shock uh, uh, turbulence. We, are, we, we don't see a sensitivity anymore uh, to the resolution, but of course that uh, aspect requires further investigation and much more investment of computer time. Now, if I'm granted more time, I'm no, I don't know, I'm now uh, mostly at the end of these 50 minutes, which we were scheduled, which we had scheduled for the talk. Uh, I would uh, be able to talk about uh, observational consequences. Uh, I, I don't want to push forward now. Uh, what I had prepared most is not neutrino and gravitational wave signals. I'm not, no, I'm not sure that anybody at, uh, at CETA is interested in that. I have a couple of slides prepared for neutron star kicks, asymmetric mass ejection, and large scale asymmetries uh, in, in supernova explosions, which actually can be connected to observable uh, phenomena in uh, supernova remnants in CRAP, uh, but also in, uh, in Cassiopeia A and supernova 1987A. Uh, we have done light curve studies in particular for supernova 87A, which now provide a strong evidence that supernova 1987A is linked to a binary progenitor. There's other observational hints for that, but we also have now a new a kind of um, yeah, diagnostics, the light curve, which also points to the binarity of the 87A progenitor. And then one might talk, uh, one, could give, one might even give a separate talk about the progenitor explosion and remnant connection, which we can establish now pretty well based on our understanding of the neutrino-driven explosion mechanism. I introduced these slides where I talked about the critical phenomenon and we have understood the mechanism well enough to actually coin a kind of neutrino engine for simulating 1D explosions. And uh, in, a, in a, my, my opinion, quite a decent way. And we can calibrate the three parameters in these models by comparing to supernova 87A and the Kraft supernova, both of which are understood pretty well. And we can then run many, many, many models and see how this landscape of black hole formation uh, and neutron star formation events um, how this uh, landscape is shaped and which kind of explosion energies we can expect from the neutrino driven mechanism. So this would be something I could continue to talk or we can talk about in the discussion session. Otherwise, if the audience is satisfied by what they have learned now, 
uh, I might stop now. My voice actually also tells me I should stop now. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. So uh, thank you so much. It's an awesome presentation. Oh, and I see that uh, we already have a question. So um, Rodrigo, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, Thomas. Uh, yeah, hi. Question for you. Um, I have, have two questions, but the first question is, going back to the issue of uh, 3D progenitors, yeah. do you have a sense for what is more important that the density fluctuations are more physical or the effects of the 3D convection and the density profile and hence the accretion right, on the explodability? Yeah, the that's most. a good question. And this is uh, actually still um, um, a work in progress by Anasa Aptigamalov and collaborators. Bernard Müller did an analysis a couple of years ago based on very simple arguments, just considering the continuity equations during collapse. And this is published in a paper I had with Bernhard Müller in 2017. And from that study, actually, uh, we diagnosed that it's more the velocity, the initial velocity perturbations, which actually fold into growing density perturbations during collapse. And the density perturbations then meeting the shock are the ones which are the most crucial ones. Yeah. OK, if I may, a short second questions. Are there any efforts underway to simulate in 3D progenitors for which better prescriptions for, say, the mixing coefficients have been developed based on this uh, multidimensional stellar convection simulation? Yeah, that's a good question. But you know that the mixing and uh, three-dimensional effects play a role in many stages of stellar evolution. Um, I'm not sure that because the way backwards from three-dimensional simulations backwards to coining better descriptions or prescriptions of mixing treatments and mixing parameters in uh, one-dimensional models, that's a question by itself. And over decades, there were different uh, ways to do that. Uh, currently, a colleague of mine, uh, Max Planck, is investigating uh, a, a modeling or an ansatz which has been developed by Rudi Kufus as a PhD student some 30 years ago when I was still a PhD student or more than 30 years ago at my institute. These older theoretical, let me say, developments and improvements are only now included in modern models and only by this colleague of mine working with his own cell evolution code, not even to talk about MESA and other codes, uh, Kepler and MESA still use old prescriptions. So I would say this is a, a theory question by itself. And I don't know at the moment any good ways of exploiting the knowledge from three-dimensional models uh, to coin better parameters that were, uh, in, in one-dimensional treatments. There has been some effort by Dave Arnett and Mikin and collaborators, but I don't think that this has ended up in, in, a, in, in recipes which can be used in stellar evolution models. Otherwise, they would have been introduced already, I guess. And there is also some work, um, I think, um, uh, by Sean Couch, uh, uh, they have some uh, some recent models out in the literature also, where they investigated three-dimensional um, um, uh, progenitor evolution for seven or ten minutes, I think. Um, I'm not aware of any existing recipes, uh, and this is really a big enterprise, I would say, to end up uh, with such uh, more suitable prescriptions for stellar 1D models. It's going to take a long time. I yeah. worked on some niche aspects of this, which have not at all been uh, yeah. uh, incorporated into the codes yet, and uh, yeah. it's a uh, it's a yeah. long effort. Yeah, for for earlier stages of cell evolution, there is efforts in quite a number of groups. Raphael Hirschi in 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 in, in Kiel, uh, also another group uh, of uh, around a female a female theorist uh, who is doing three dimensional simulations, also in in in, in in the, in the UK, uh, don't recall her name now. Uh, there is also work by Falk Herwig and collaborators. This concerns earlier evolution stages, helium core burning, uh, helium shell burning. Uh, there is a lot of efforts of finding recipes, how to improve one dimensional but, modeling uh, based on three dimensional simulations. But, I mean, just to be more a bit precise, uh, huge uncertainty is still about what the rotational profiles are in con convective regions, especially oh, no, deep just, convective yes. regions. Yes. And also the development of magnetic fields. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, as you yes. know, there's this Spruit uh, dynamo mechanism that's been incorporated yes. into the codes. Absolutely. But I, I, Absolutely. It, that, yeah. that magnetic fields have a huge effect on the rotation profile and the, on the mixing. And yes. 
that's actually one on on the slide which uh, which ends my second part of the talk uh, where i summarize a couple of uh, issues which are unsolved exactly the point of rotation and magnetic fields during stellar evolution but also during stellar core collapse is mentioned there we don't think based on astroseismological observations based on as you said this is the Taylor Sprut dynamo. Uh, we don't think that stellar cores rotate rapidly for the large number of uh, normal supernovae, but for extreme cases, superluminous supernovae, hypernovae, gamma ray burst supernovae, we think that rotation is essential and magnetic field amplification aids the explosions and powers the explosion there. Well, actually, what do you think of um, Bert Mueller's recent publication that? Uh, even in a non-rotating collapse, a magnetic field can uh, aid the explosion in some cases. Yeah, I, I, I know this paper and I know this work, yeah. I think, I mean, I, I cannot judge whether these uh, simulations are numerics-wise correct or not, because he has developed this code more or less uh, very uh, newly. There has not been any recent comparison to other magnetohydrodynamic studies. Uh, let, let us assume, uh, let us assume that the simulations have no numerical issue. They don't explain the effect, by the way, in this paper. They, they, they actually uh, speculate, but in the end, they confess that they don't understand exactly what kind of effects uh, are helpful uh, with respect to magnetic fields. But the influence of magnetic fields seen in this simulation are actually relatively meager. They are on the same order of magnitude as we know other physics effects uh, can make changes. Yeah. I mentioned this Bollig et al. paper. When you go there, in this paper, this recent work published in APJ, APJ in 2021 on the Archive server in 2020, in this paper, we had another physics effect, which we know is reality, actually. Namely, we included the muons in the neutron star. And the muons lead to higher neutrino energies. And this actually also helps the explosion to start earlier. So, uh, and the equation of state is the same. You can change the equation of state and you will probably also be able to change the onset of the explosion uh, on the order of let's say 100 milliseconds or so. And this is about what M Müller and Varna found in their recent papers with respect to magnetic field and effects. So magnetic field was amplified by turbulence in the post shock layer. And then they see and they say based on these simulations that this magnetic field amplification helps the onset of the explosion and pushes it a little forward in time. But I don't think that this is a crucial ingredient in this non-rotating models. Yeah. And we've also had another question from Shinyu. Shinyu, please go ahead. Thomas, uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah, I want to add something you didn't touch in this talk yeah. about the neutrino oscillations. So I'm wondering, would, so you've done a bunch of uh, numerical simulations on this. I'm wondering like that observations, would you think it would be possible to get yes. in our uh, perspectives? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a very bad connection. It's probably not on my side. I'm in the Institute and have a high speed internet connection, but maybe you can repeat your question so that I can really answer your question in detail. Uh, yes, I just want to know, oh, what do you think about the observational tests for this neutrino oscillations from like 1987A or other future observations? Yeah, okay. You mean, you mean observational indications of neutrino oscillations, observational hints? That yes, is what, yes. What you ask. Well, yeah, yeah, especially fast oscillations. Yeah, yeah fast oscillations. Well, um, I must say, as rotation in progenitor and core collapse uh, physics, uh, fast neutrino flavor oscillations is one point on my final slide of open issues. Uh, there is strong hints uh, from the theory side that fast flavor oscillations may be of relevance in the supernova core. But to be honest, none of the theoretical studies so far, at least not any I know, have really made strong predictions of observable uh, effects from uh, based on these flavor oscillation uh, changes, uh, flavor uh, fast flavor conversion effects. So uh, I, I really would not be able on the theory side uh, to make a strong statement uh, with respect to what kind of observational consequences such fast flavor oscillations may have. There's an ongoing study in my group uh, by uh, Jakob Ehring. Uh, he's supervised by Georg Raffelt and myself. 
um, and also Sashat uh, Abar is involved in that project where we now include uh, fast flavor conversions in supernova simulations. We hope that the project within the next couple of months will lead to a kind of a insight into which kind of observables may be changed. I'm a bit, bit concerned, to be honest, that the effects on the explosion itself are rather mild, maybe not really visible and diagno di diagnosed, uh, diag uh, uh, accessible, <laughs> let me say, uh, accessible to diagnostics at all. Uh, maybe there is some effects on the nucleosynthesis and the major changes which we might be able to see with a good understanding of the supernova neutrino emission and that good high statistic neutrino signal may come on the neutrino emission side and the neutrino properties which can be then uh, seen in a detector and, and can be measured in a detector. But you know that for that case uh, or for this possibility, we need a galactic supernova, which may take a, a while to wait for still. I see, yeah. Thank you. But to be honest, I mean, this question is really not answered at the moment by anything which is in the literature. What are the observable consequences or possible observable consequences of fast flavor conversions? I'm really looking forward uh, for the results of my of my PhD student. Uh, we also have another question from Peter. Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. It's super interesting. Thank Your you. last slide, uh, some of the points reminded me of uh, uh, the Cassay supernova remnant, where yeah. back yeah. in the old days, Sidney Vandenberg found, I think it was oxygen rich knots outside the supernova remnant. Yes. And then there's beautiful it's here. stuff it's, it's here. On, on the X ray emission, line yeah. emission. Now, yeah. is, that, is that more connected to the, well, I guess one, the first for sure is yeah. very uh, radical asymmetric mass ejection, but is there also nucleosynthesis going on at the same time, uh, these things couple? Yes, that's a very good question. And actually at the heart of what I wanted to talk um, or would have talked about in the second part of my, uh, my talk, I, I was uh, prepared not to, to, uh, to, um, to show it because I know that these are actually two talks packed into one. Yeah, there is interesting nucleosynthesis, an interesting connection to the explosion asymmetries. Here's an example of a set of three-dimensional models which uh, were run by Anno Bongwan. Mm -hmm. These were not fully self-consistent, but we put in neutrino energy deposition in a relatively reasonable way to initiate three-dimensional explosions. And you can see that the iron group nucleosynthesis, this is here iron group material, is highly asymmetric. Uh, and it's coupled to the neut neutron star kick. So the neutron star kick points in the opposite direction uh, to the ejection of this iron material from the core. And you see similar asymmetries actually for titanium 44, but you see asymmetries also down to, um, or in, in mass down to neon uh, and, 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 and silicon. So there is highly asymmetric ejection of material, which is tightly linked to the asymmetries of the onset of the explosion and to the neutron star kick. And this has actually been diagnosed in a couple of supernova remnants here in a collaboration with a Japanese uh, group, uh, there is uh, Anop and myself are on that paper, and there is also work by Ashford Holland, Holland Ashford and collaborators. And as you said, Cassiopeia A, this is a, a case where you see directly the titanium, and we compared this uh, Gravenstetter results to our simulations. And the uh, left hand side, you see the asymmetry from the observation. Uh, this is titanium 44 in Cassiopeia A, the neutron star kick. Uh, at least the projected kick on the sphere, um, um, on the plane of the sky. And here you see one of our explosion models, the one which looks like Cassiopeia A clo most closely uh, in the same orientation. And you see, we would expect titanium and iron to be ejected in the opposite direction. And this is from the geometry, very similar to Cas A. We work together with Orlando, with uh, um, Salvatore Orlando uh, to continue the simulation to the stage of the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And just let me show you how this explosion develops. And at the age of Cassiopeia A, we see these crownish structures, we see the rings, we see these bullets shooting out. So I think we can explain from these three-dimensional supernova models with neutrino heating started, the morphology of Cassiopeia A nowadays pretty well. Thank you for giving me the chance to show this. Uh, I would that's, have that, that's really exciting. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a paper out, by the way. Uh, the first author is Salvatore Orlando. 
Orlando. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We also have a question here in the comments from Chris Metzner. Yeah. Uh, do fast oscillations in, in regard to neutrinos, do fast oscillations not affect the effective cross sections? No, they don't do. I mean, I don't know what you mean by effective, but what you, uh, I mean, what you convert is electron neutrinos and anti neutrinos. You convert them partially into muon tau neutrinos uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, yes, of course, this makes a difference because the spectra of electron neutrinos and anti neutrinos and muon tau neutrinos are different. But uh, nowadays, the mean energies of electron antineutrinos and the muon tau neutrinos are very, very similar. So uh, the spectral difference of muon tau neutrinos compared to electron antineutrinos doesn't play so much a role anymore. Moreover, this conversion of electron neutrinos and antineutrinos into muon tau neutrinos is to some extent limited by the fact that each neutrino converting has to find a counter antineutrino to convert and the electron neutrinos are still more abundant than anti neutrinos at the time of emission. So this also limits the efficiency of this conversion, both together, the spectral similarity and the limitation of the fast flavor pairwise conversion by the pairing uh, need of neutrinos. Uh, this both together, in my opinion, will lead to rather moderate modifications of the neutrino heating paradigm. Okay, I think we're done with the questions. So let's thank our speaker again. And I think this concludes, stop the recording. Thank you for the questions. And thank you for